Why is it important? Here's my favorite phrase someone else taught me. Presence doesn't equate to proficiency. And you have a manual that goes through every slide and every piece of information you're going to be shared with today. Just because you have a tool doesn't mean I know how to use it well, does it? How many times you showed up and you're like, been off for two weeks, come in, you're like, hey, when did we get this thing? Oh, they put it on the truck two weeks ago. How do we operate? I don't know. Is that how we do business? But yet we're professionals, right? We're going to talk about what we were all taught, and we're going to talk about physics, science, and fire service teachings and how they differ, facts versus what we are seeing. I want you to watch this. Every fire we go to, after the fire has reached a control time, the forward progress of the incident has stopped, we have to wait 45 minutes from the time we get zero readings and we blow that, the building out that we can start overhaul without wearing an air pack. That's our cancer initiative. We don't expose our guys or gals to anything. During that 45 minutes, I've found that's a good time to talk and do some after action and training. I saw the company officer used, he did a size up. He had the tick on his coat, but he never picked it up. They did a VES the second floor. He pushed through the fire in the first floor to find the stairs because he couldn't find the stairs. Tell me where the stairs are. This is the Delta side of a two-story box house. No windows, no doors on this side. Watch closely. See them now? See the riser? See the return above it? See the platform? See the distance between the studs and the wall? That's called thermal bridging. Fancy word for conduction. You're seeing the temperature difference between where the studs touch the wall and the space in between. It is not x-ray vision. Everybody understand that? One thing you'll learn when you talk about somebody said, I want to learn the limitations, you're seeing temperature differences of surfaces, not gases. You're not seeing through anything. You don't see uh, hazmat gases per se, but you can see the effects of them. You're seeing the effects of temperature on surfaces and temperature differences. That's what the camera reads, and it doesn't read it accurately. See that little number in the bottom right-hand corner? That's the greatest issue next to not carrying the camera. It is not a thermometer. When I teach, one of my instructors taught me to do this. When he's showing a student how hot something is, he simply says, he puts his thumb over that number and goes, how hot is that? And you'll hear him kind of pause for a second. They're like, well, I can't see the number. He says, you don't need to see the number. You need to look at the whole range and this temperature bar. That number on the bottom right-hand corner can be several hundred degrees off. One of the largest departments in the nation called me during the height of COVID and asked if they could use the Bullard T3Xs to check their firefighters' foreheads for temperature, for fever. I said, if you'd like to, it's off by plus or minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit from the factory. Pretty sure an FDA-rated thermometer has to be off by plus or minus half a degree Fahrenheit. Okay? So how many of you are familiar with Paul Combs? Greatest fire service educator I think there is, because he can teach more of us with a cartoon than I could teach you in an eight-hour class. Because we relate to images, don't we? And I relate to this one a lot. Three firefighters ran into a burning building because we have to get in there. How many times have you been told that? Get in there, right? So these three firefighters went in without a hose line, without a search line, without a designated adult, apparently, and without a 360, and they were relying on the thermal imaging camera to find their way. How many times have you relied on this to provide you directions, and all of a sudden Siri or whoever it is quit working? You pull over and buy a map or ask for directions, that's a pretty humbling experience, right? Can you pull over and buy a map or ask for directions when you're inside of a 10,000 square foot building and the thermal imaging camera fails and you have no idea where you are? You're in trouble. There is no substitute for knowing the basics. The fundamentals are the fundamentals. That should be your foundation. A thermal imaging camera is a secondary means of orientation. You hear me? That's your plan B, not your plan A. Because here's why. Everything I'll share with you today are mistakes we made or observed in our classes. We will not throw any department under the bus. We'll throw ourselves under the bus. There'll be tire tracks across me before the end of the day. In 2017, in 30 plus years, I've never brought out a live victim. They've all been dead. And the one time I needed to use my thermal imaging camera, guess what it did? And you know why it did that? I caused the problem. I did not know if you take a thermal imaging camera and you lay it on a hot engine house cover, like right there in between the driver and the captain, and lay it there all day long, it's clipped to my air pack, guess what it does to my battery as the engine gets hot and runs calls all day long? We ran medicals all day long. I'm sure y'all don't run any medicals, right? We didn't run a fire till that night. I turn it on at 11.30 that night for a food on the stove, which turns into a second alarm apartment fire, which turns into three people trapped, all in cardiac arrest. 
I turn it on, it says full battery. I walk the 300 feet to the front of the house. Our job is to take a second line inside. It's a 600 square foot apartment. They tell us don't bring the second line, it's too crowded. And all I see, ladies and gentlemen, is this. What is that flashing red thing at the bottom? It means dead battery. It means you have less than five minutes until this turns off. Please don't pay attention to the 159 degree Fahrenheit number. That's an issue I told you about. You saw that doorway to the right? That's the apartment that a mom, a six-year-old, and a nine-year-old who had just celebrated a birthday party, and the mom fell asleep cooking french fries, and the, her apartment, the hallway, and the next door apartment, none of them had working smoke detectors. The next door apartment called 911 because her apartment was full of smoke. We were there as a fire department looking in her apartment for the fire when they realized it was the one next door. They force it, take a line in, they run over the mother, Okay, with a thermal imaging camera, don't see her. She's in the hallway trying to get the kids dead. I'm told not to bring a line in. I told my guy to stay at the bottom of the stairs. I walk up, my camera dies. I walk past the mother. Walk, not get down like I'm supposed to. See a burnt pan, a small amount of damage to a cabinet. And my coworkers on ladder two, I hear on the radio, ladder two to command, we're coming out with a victim. And I see Greg Nicholson, who's six foot five, with a lady, he's lifting up like this, and her feet are dragging the ground, she's so tall. And then his firefighter one, Patrick Saunders, who took his life last year, that's why I'm passionate about that, bringing her out. That haunts me to this day. I went right by her. I grabbed two of my guys. I go to the end of the hallway because we know the layout. We are oriented. We know where we're going, right? Government-style apartment, living room, kitchen, little hallway, bathroom in the center, two bedrooms. Sound familiar? I send one left and one right. I'm going to show you who didn't fail me. See these guys right here? This is my driver that day. This is the man who made the rescue of Tremaine. That's Kevin Warlick, who brought out Tremaine's cousin. And that's Brian Gilmore, who him and I worked on this little guy. From the time we brought him out, we never stopped working him all the way to the hospital. I saw him take his breath. It's still to this day. I remember when he went, <gasps> and then I was overjoyed. And then I had to tell his family that his mom and his cousin were dead. Their batteries didn't die. This lady is now his godmother who runs a ministry called Backpacks for Michael who passes out backpacks with school supplies and, and uh, smoke detectors. My, my company donates money to them every year. And the best day in my career was spending a day with him. He is now nine, playing basketball, being a kid. That's our reward. But I'm telling you, do not rely on technology as your sole source of navigation and your sole source of orientation. Everybody good with that? I share that with you up front because these things are awesome. But they can hinder you, and you, some of you said, I want to know the limitations. The biggest limitation is the person holding it. Because you can over-rely on it, you can expect it to do things it shouldn't do, and it will fail you. Okay? So we're going to spend the first hour talking about why. Why is this important? What do you think you understand versus what we really understand about the environment we work in? And I have a question that I'm going to pose to you from my father. My father spent over 40 years in the fire service, all volunteer, never got paid a day in his life for it. And he says, your PPE has specific limitations. It's designed to protect your firefighters. It's tested to a specified limit. Yet our tactics do not reflect those limitations. Okay? And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, let's, let's dig into that a little deeper. How many of you check the weather every morning you get up or the night before if you've got an event or you're taking your kids somewhere or you're doing something? I look at it every night. I need to know, does the daughter need to wear a coat? Is she going to be able to go to her dance recital that's being held outside? Right? I was in Ohio last week. It was 30 degrees one day. It was 70 degrees the next day. It was snowing the next day. We need to know, right? It can affect our plans. But when you go to a working fire, what is not considered, measured, or checked from the outside or as you push down that hallway? What is not considered, checked, tested, verified as you move from the front door to the seat of the fire? At least we think it, it isn't. What is it? Heat, temperature, duration of exposure. And you're like, well, why? I don't, I don't understand. Think of the last fire you went to and ask yourself this question. What was the temperature of the last hallway you crawled? And why should you care? Because here's the number one statement I have heard in the last 13 years of teaching this, why firefighters didn't open the nozzle. Chief, it wasn't that hot. 
I want you to meet a little boy by the name of Tremaine who had Spider-Man pajamas burned to his arm that were made of polyester. And I want you to ask him what he thinks of your subjective definition of it wasn't that hot. That's our problem. We say it's for them, BS. It's for us because you're pushing it to show off ego at that point. Because you don't feel anything till five, 600 degrees. What does that do to an unprotected six-year-old or a mother or an elderly patient, a mom, a dad, who's wearing probably flammable clothing, if you think about what our stuff's made of. How many of you like Under Armour stuff? That's like shrink wrap, okay? They're wearing that in there at 200 degrees. They're done. About 150 to 160 degrees, it's melting to them. Okay, think about that. We are great at putting out the fire. You know what we are not good at? Getting rid of heat on the way to the fire. What about that victim that's in the living room, in the hallway, that's not behind a closed door? Closed doors are awesome. Got a great chance of survival. If they're in the flow path and we don't make it better for them, we're negligent, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just telling you. And we're going to be held to that standard one day. There's enough savvy lawyers that are figuring out the fire service is a litigation-rich environment. There's three cases right now in the improper use of thermal imaging cameras and firefighting tactics where the fire department is going to lose. They're quoting NFPA, they're quoting textbooks, they're quoting subject matter experts that these firefighters might even know that's going to be used to condemn that one firefighter who made that decision as a company officer. The fire department will fire you, they'll sue you civilly, and they'll have a new rule based on your actions. Is that how you want to affect change? No. So let's talk about what we should do. We want to enhance what you already know. I don't want to throw out your fundamentals. I want to enhance them. I want you to understand thermal severity or heat and how that affects the victim, the property, and you in that order. Does that make sense? Because who's the most protected in this environment? You are. Tremaine's not wearing globe gear and a Scott air pack. That's what y'all wear, right? Globe gear and a Scott air pack, okay? And the last point, if you teach firefighters, how many of you do any teaching? You know the most important thing you can know about teaching someone is giving them experiential relevance. Can they use it today? Can they relate it to their world? That's why I asked you, what camera are you using? What camera are you using? How many people you got on a truck? Right? I need to know that when I'm trying to teach. I, I got to try to relate to you. I can't, I can't relate to you if I don't know your environment. So that's what we're going to do today. Watch this and tell me if you would open the nozzle from the outside on this. Because there were several people yesterday said that they would not. Now they're changing their opinion. That's three to 600 degrees of surface temperatures and a window that I was told I can't see through showing three to 600 degrees behind it coming at me. And the fire is down the hallway, three rooms away on the opposite end. Think about how hot it is where the fire room is if that's what you're seeing at the carport side door. And that's not smoke temperature. You're not reading smoke. You're seeing the heat from the, that heating up the surfaces. And you're seeing fast moving, nasty, turbulent smoke that you probably were taught in, in reading smoke that that was bad. Then you're seeing the heat behind it that's nearing points that can definitely kill you. Well, if it can kill you, what is it doing to an unprotected victim? They're already dead if you don't do something about it. Or they, you know, I'm not going to argue survivability, but my friend Sean Duffy says it best. Is it searchable? Can we get them out, right? So let's talk about what's changed and what's not. In the last 20 years, how many of you have been on 15 or 20 years? Good for you. Has building construction changed for you in the last 15 or 20 years? How many of you watched a McDonald's or a fast food restaurant be remodeled? They come in, they bulldoze it, and they put it back up in 90 days or six months now because of supply shortages. Several years ago, they tore down my daughter's favorite McDonald's, and I was happy because they had one of those germ pit ball things. And they got rid of it. <laughs> she was very upset. She was seven. We drove by it when it was dried in. I said, what does it look like? Just the wood frame. She said, it looks like popsicle sticks, glue, and staples, Daddy. Is that a pretty appropriate statement from a seven-year-old about the world you and I work in? Think about your home. What is the sides of it wrapped in before you put vinyl siding or siding on it? OSB? What is OSB? Sawdust and glue? Basically, that gasoline? So that has changed. And then we talk about interior components like laminated I-beams. They got smart start two by fours, which are two one by twos with a piece of OSB in it, same as an I-beam. They're making stairs out of OSB with gusset plates. International Code Council approved a few years ago something called lightweight drywall. That means you now have drywall with pockets of polyurethane pellets embedded into it. Remember the 60s and 70s when they had this beautiful varnished panel, pine paneling that lit off really well? 
Now you got gasoline on the outside and gasoline on the inside, and then what is this made of? Are you sitting on an oak table with a nice solid oak chair behind you? What are you sitting on? What is this stuff made of? <coughs> Solidified petroleum products, synthetics. Let's think about this. This is some, what you've heard food for thought. I'm going to give you fuel for thought. How many of you have one overstuffed chair somewhere in your house, maybe in your living room, like a recliner, wingback chair, you know, just something to plop down in, read a book, or neighbors stop by and say, you have one of those? One overstuffed chair is the same as five gallons of gasoline heat release rate. One chair. One chair is enough to flash over a 12 by 12 room. I would wager the average fire you go in has got more than one chair, doesn't it? Our living room has a sectional, an Ikea cabinet, you heard of them? They make everything out of sawdust and gasoline. My wife loves it because every three years we can throw it away and get something new. And then we have two chairs, we have a cheap bookcase, and we had a dog bed, and if she gets her way, we're going to have another dog bed at the end of this year. So I got about 50 gallons of gasoline in the living room, in a 12 by 18 space. And the way we attack fires, we leave the front door open and the nozzle closed. Are you okay with that? Are you? So here's what's happened, ladies and gentlemen. In the last 20 years, all of this stuff has changed, 20, 30 years. And what did the fire service do despite all the research, despite all the science, despite all the firefighters who have died doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, which is a definition of insanity? We simply changed our uniforms. We upgraded our PPE. If you've been on at least 20 years, I bet your gear felt a little different 20 years ago than it did today. Now, I got some good news. There's some really cool stuff coming out with gear designs that's going to bring pain back, and it's going to bring back some interesting things that's more focused on cardiac health than it is about how, how long you can sit in Satan's living room and not feel anything. Okay, because Al Huxley, a famous humanist, says is what science has actually done is given us better ways to get ourselves killed. Improved means to deteriorated ends is his actual quote. Do you think that's probably the case because now we have gear that's so good, you can get so deep that by the time you feel it, it's what? Too late. We're going to explore that in depth, okay? Oh, by the way, how many of you show up and see fires like this right here? Nasty, turbulent smoke, maybe not a lot of flame. What kind of fire is that? Vent limited. Man reads the slide. I like it. Ventilation limited fire. What does that mean? What is it waiting on? Help me out. O2. O2. All right, let's think about this for a second. Right now, there's a big push called Close Before You Doze campaign. We tell the public when they go to bed at night, do what? Close the door. If a dispatcher is talking to someone leaving a burning building, they tell them to do what as they leave the building? Close the door. You go home tonight, you're going to cook a big fat cheeseburger on the grill, and all of a sudden it's one of those, you know, it's got a little fat in it, gets a little grease fire. Do you leave the lid off and run inside and get some water? You throw water in there and close it, right? So everything we're taught is about isolate, confine, restrict it. But yet when we show up, we kick every door and window out of it and don't give it water and are surprised when we complete the fire triangle and it lights off and chases us out of the building. Does that sound contradictory? Because that smoke I was taught not to cool where he's walking out the door is 900 plus degrees around that surface of that door where he came out of. So how hot do you think the smoke is? If I'm not reading smoke, it's probably a lot hotter than that. This is not an optical gas imaging camera. There's a specific industry just for that for where you, the state you're in, you have a lot of refineries. Go visit them. Ask, hey, do you have an OGI camera? They'll look at you funny and say, how did you know that? Because They're looking for leaks because that costs them money and they don't want big incidents to happen. So we have houses now that are built like this. This is a living room in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I work. It's a 20, excuse me, a 50 by 50 living room. This is bigger than my whole house in Ballantyne. Look at the ceiling joist here. So they have that, and then we fill it full of solidified petroleum products, furniture, and then I wrap you in the best gear money can buy, and I tell you in recruit school to look for signs of fire to attack and wait till you feel it to open the nozzle, and then I put you in an environment where you can't feel and you can't see, and I expect you to perform like gold medal athletes. Do you see a problem here? And guess what? 50% of the time, where do you think this was during all of those fire attacks? on the charger of the fire truck. Per Firehouse Magazine, we did a survey last year. We thought it gotten better. Firefighters are leaving it on the truck more. It's a problem. And here's the problem has exacerbated because in the late 90s when this first started, you were required to have education and training. It was provided to you by the manufacturer. Part of the money you, you spent on that camera paid a company to come in and train you. Then a few years after that, they quit paying that because they got greedy. 
So what's the smallest budget in every organization known in the fire service? Anybody know? Training. My department has a $145 million budget and we operate on a $112,000 training academy budget. We can barely buy wood with that. Okay? So let me ask you this question. Lots of thermal imaging cameras out there today, right? Some of them been around a little too long. This is Frontline three years ago in West Virginia. Thor would hold this and say, ugh, this is heavy. This is a black and white TV on a stick. This is a Bullard MX. It's 21 years old in a new half million dollar fire truck. You can buy this device for around $3,000 and I hear the words, we can't afford it. You're in a half million dollar to million dollar fire truck and we see fire departments not replacing these. Per the U.S. Fire Administration, 70% of America only had one thermal imaging camera on the fire ground in 2015. That meant 9,000 fire departments did not have one. This problem is bigger than you think. So I got some questions for you, because you got different departments in the room, not just Dallas represented today, right? Does your tick department have a tick training program? Do you have written policies that address said training? Do you address the training requirements for it? Who shall carry it? How they'll do things on certain incidents? Do you address this annually in competency and classroom, hands-on, live fire? Do you provide training on the device before it is placed into service? Why? The only training standard in existence use words such as shall. NFPA 1408, the Thermal Imaging Training Standard, says a TI training program shall be implemented. The authority shall establish written policies. The policy shall address training requirements. The training policy shall include an annual review of member competence. And TI training shall include practical evolutions using TI, and it continues on and on with you shall do this. In other words, you shall not put this on the truck unless you have trained your members on how to use it and have written policies on it and review it annually. You know, 40% of the fire service didn't even know that training standard exists because they think NFPA stands for not for practical application until you go to court and they say the following. You went to a working fire with a kid trapped. You deploy without hesitation. The mom's in the front yard screaming. My daughter's in that back bedroom right there. That is a targeted search, not a primary search. You're going right to it. You bring said child out. Sadly, the child passes away. Six months later, a lawyer shows up and says, here's your subpoena, be in court on this date. He takes your thermal imaging camera as evidence. You go to court, and the first thing you see is a mom with burns on her arm where she stuck her own arm through the window to get her child. And says, she stands up and says, my tax dollars paid for this device. My tax dollars paid for the training for this device. And the research behind it, data-driven, shows that Boston, FDNY, and Chicago all rescued the victim 70% faster when they used it, but they missed the victim 60% of the time when they didn't. My daughter should be alive today. You ever heard of preponderance of evidence? It means if you're a little bit wrong, you're wrong. In civil court, that's enough to get you. You're done. This is where we're heading. Because we don't even read our own rules. And we darn sure don't even read the instructions on stuff. And this is why it's important. It is the lack of... The lack of tick usage is the sixth rank risk factor in line of duty deaths. 38% of the time the camera is left on the charger. And why is that the sixth rank risk factor? Because we like to get lost and disoriented a lot. It accounted for 18% of all fire ground injuries last year. That's a lot of injuries. Everybody talks about line of duty deaths. Have you looked at how many of us get hurt and then result in time off from work? It's anywhere between 30 and 60,000 injuries a year depending on which year you look at. That's a lot. How many of you have had an injury where it required time off from work? I've spent a year and a half on light duty total in my 24 years at my current department from being stupid. I broke my leg, I separated my bicep tendon from trying to bench too much, and then I ripped my knee in half standing over a, a rotten floor. Does that hurt your lifestyle, your family when you're out of work? Yeah. Anybody familiar with the following? Wooster 6, Charleston 9. What happened to those firefighters? got disoriented in a building that the employees got lost in when the lights were on under normal operations. The building had been vacant for over 10 years. There were supposedly two homeless people inside. They were down the street eating at a restaurant. Chief McAmey stood in front of the door and said, no more. There had been a lot more than six dead. The Charleston 9 should have been the Charleston 18. If you haven't taken Dr. David Griffin's class, I highly recommend it. Nine additional firefighters were lost trying to rescue their brothers and sisters. 
and they found a wall, pounded on the wall, they cut the hole and got them out. One Meridian Plaza, three firefighters died, the RIT team was rescued by a helicopter off the roof. One out of every five RIT teams experiences a mayday, doing the exact same thing that got the other ones in trouble. You think we got a problem? And if you read these reports, ladies and gentlemen, you will see a consistent common thread in every line of duty death repeated over and over again, and yet no accountability. We recently had a firefighter die in a neighboring department that our city surrounds in, and we were very impacted by it. I did all of the behavioral health work with it, with my group, and this young man was 21 years old, and the fine for his death was less than $2,000. What in the world does that achieve? If you read these reports, you will find the following threads. Reading fire behavior indicators and recognizing fire conditions serve as the basis for predicting likely and potential fire behavior. In other words, we don't see it coming. Why not? When you go into a fire, can you see? Not very well. Can you feel? Not a whole lot. And then the camera's on the truck. How about this one? Ventilation, where, whether horizontal or vertical, shall be coordinated with what? Fire attack. How many times have you seen that perfectly done? How many times have you seen it where it didn't go well? You got truck company A and engine company F. Or you got engine company A and the truck company vents late or wrong. What does that do to the fire? Could make it worse. Could cause conditions to change drastically or tragically for them. The firefighters found themselves between the fire and the ventilation point. Does this sound familiar to you? I was taught to attack the fire from the unburned side. If the fire is on the Charlie's side and I open the front door, I am between the fire and the ventilation point. And if I go down the hallway and I don't open the nozzle, am I attacking the fire? What's attacking? The fire is sending millions of little heat bullets and attacking me and I'm not shooting back. So where is the fire now going? Towards that seven by three ventilation opening knows the front door towards me. I'm dragging and drawing heat, products of combustions to me if I don't tactically change its path with my hose line, with my choice of ventilation, whatever you do, make the fire better, not worse. And you don't have to experience a NIOSH report or a line of duty death to, to have this last bullet point. I throw myself under the bus. Am I the only one in the room has, has had trouble finding the fire or stretched a, a line to the wrong place? First fire as a captain. Just completed nozzle forward. I'm all jacked up. I'm brand new relief captain. We call them substitute teachers. You don't have a home. You bounce around to different companies. Duplex, smoke pushing from the back of it. It is early in the morning, low atmospheric ceiling, smoke's coming over the back. We show up, engine 10 and engine 2 pull up side by side. Engine 2 flakes our hose, pinches it under a tire. We flake our hose, go up the front, kick down the left front door, no tick, no 360, and start flowing water as the door is open. And I'm screaming, no, as I realize this is a perfectly clean, occupied apartment with a lady sitting there drinking her coffee, reading her paper as the straight stream hits her in the face and knocks the coffee and paper out of her hand. It is a dumpster fire behind the duplex, pushing smoke over the top. No fire into her building. Dear Chief, I find myself explaining to you why I'm an idiot. A newly promoted idiot, by the way, because I got rank now. See why a size up's important? So I was taught, tell me if this rings true, not to open the nozzle till I see fire, not to open the nozzle till I feel heat. Do not upset the thermal balance, which exists because there is a fire, and to not steam the victim. And if I do all these things in today's fire environment, this is one minute, 48 seconds long. This is a couch, a chair, and carpet in my dad's organization. This room reaches 1,832 degrees thermal couple reading at the ceiling and 600 degrees right here at the floor. Is 212 degrees of wet steam a concern to them? When the floor is 600 degrees. You hear me? 1,200 parts per million carbon monoxide that we know of, 3,400 parts per million of hydrogen cyanide that we know of. What is lethal? Well, that's way past lethal. And the nozzle closed and we, we're calling ourselves heroes. We're letting them cook and breathe that stuff. Okay? And here's where we start. The 1950s fireman's manual. This is my dad's manual. It says, water will not extinguish smoke. Do not open the nozzle till you see fire. And you're like, surely. In 2022, no one's doing that. In 2017, I took the battalion chief's exam and a textbook that rhymes with Jones and Bartlett said in the fire behavior chapter, the firefighter shall not open the nozzle till he or she sees fire because they will upset the thermal balance and steam the victim. I politely pulled out the little piece of paper they gave me to challenge questions with and stopped my test. 
and I wrote the names of firefighters who died doing that, including my own department, and said, if you choose to embrace this methodology and leave this in place, these firefighters died for nothing, and you can remove me from the promotional process. That textbooks are not peer-reviewed. Do you realize that? Nobody's checking that stuff. This is still being taught today. Okay? That's a problem. And you want to know why I know that? Because I travel a lot. I go to fires where fire departments are just doing training fires, acquired structures, and simply ask, hey, can I film? If, I, if you'll let me film, I'll do a 30-minute or an hour-long tip class for free. You just let me capture the video. This is a department doing a 1403 burn in my home state. I want you to watch as he moves up. This is a front porch. He's just shy of the front porch, and he's going to turn left. It used to be like an enclosed porch of some kind. That's why it's got that cool bookcase and the drop ceiling above the head. And this is the FLIR camera that a lot of you have. Tell me if you are okay with this type of fire attack and methodology. We're under it first. And then that's our version of penciling, which is incorrect. We stole that from our friends overseas, and that's not how they do it. And then we open the nozzle again for less than three or four seconds. And then we're going to move into a living room. And then we're going to couple short bursts of the ceiling. Then we're going to get to the fire room. Then you're going to hear the following phrase that we probably all heard. Don't put my fire out. Now, if we've never fought a fire before, what did you just do to that young firefighter? What kind of knowledge did you embed into them? That's how they're going to fight fire. Are you okay with leaving 300 to 1,000 plus degrees of superheated surfaces behind you and then a living room with furniture superheated behind you with a front door open. You have everything it needs to create ignition and nothing to stop it. And we're racing physics. Why don't we erase heat instead of penciling it? And I'll talk a lot about penciling and the danger of that. And I want you to remember this symbol as you go through class. This symbol is really important to you if you want to understand what the tick is doing on newer model ticks. There's only one or two that doesn't employ the symbol. When this camera shows you a triangle, it means low sensitivity to detail, which means high heat. You're really close to something hot, okay? So I got questions for you. Help me out. Right, wrong, or indifferent, because I'm gonna share all my failings. How were you as a firefighter taught to measure heat, to know when it was too hot? Tell me, what were you taught? Feel it on your ears. Feel it on your ears. Describe the feeling on your ears for me. What were you feeling or what did they say to wait for? Not just pain, but what did it feel like? Tingling and stinging sensations. Hmm. Remember that, please, as we move forward. What else were you taught? How about this? Pencil to ceiling, it comes back down, I'm good. Really. If it doesn't come back down, what temperature do you think it is? What, what, what temperature does water convert to steam? So you're telling me that it's at least 212. We're not dying in saunas, ladies and gentlemen. What if there's no ceiling? What if he's got a two and a half with an inch and three sixteenth tip and lets it eat? Water's gonna come back down. What if you've got a little ultra high pressure booster line and just go Psh! Water's not gonna come back down. Is that an empirical way to test temperature? We'll, we'll address that. How about my personal favorite? Take your glove off and stick your hand up in the smoke. That was in a textbook in 2016. Anyone that tells you to use your body as a thermometer to see how hot it is, the next time your child or your grandchild walks towards a hot stove, please let them touch it, because that's what you're teaching firefighters to do to measure temperature. You should let them get hurt before they realize how hot it is. Do you know what our risk management and workers' comp claim people would do to a recruit that spent 26 weeks being taught to keep his gear on, and then he or she goes to a station where a veteran firefighter tells him or her to peel their glove back or take their glove off, and stick their hand up into a thousand degree flow path and receive a critical burn. They will deny their workers comp claim and send them home. And their bills will be on them because you took off your city issued safety equipment and experienced an injury and then blamed the department. And the department never told you to do that. Does that sound like a good idea? No. So we're gonna talk about feeling heat versus seeing heat. Do you wanna wait till you feel pain before you attack the fire, because at that point the fire has already attacked and saturated your gear and saturated you, or do you want to start seeing the enemy from a long way off and using the reach of your stream? And now, bear with me for a minute. I'm going to get religious a minute. I don't care if you're smoothbore Baptist, pencil and Pentecostal, or 
uh, combination nozzle Catholic, people get upset about the fog nozzle, but if we put it on a straight stream, could we hit that back wall from here? Could we? Then why are we teaching firefighters to barely open the nozzle, if at all, and then when they get in the fire room, they're right on top of it before they open it? Why? Help me out with that. Alan Brunicini said, God rest his soul, he said, We're, we've raised an entire generation of firefighters who want to kill tigers with pocket knives. How close do you got to be to a tiger to use a pocket knife? Not me, pal. I'm not a big gun guy, but I'd have a 50 cal from way back. Okay, I want you to be a long range sniper, not a pocket knife assassin. Because look at this Max Firebox, which you will see today. Light smoke showing. How many times have you ducked and dived under that? What does the inside of that box look like according to that Fleer K55 or 65 in this case? It's at least eight, 900 to 1200 degrees at the floor. How many times have you crawled across something only to realize, ooh, that was hot? Yet, when you go out with your family and you're going to cross a street, you have the decency and the common sense to look both ways so you don't get run over, right? But yet, you won't take a device and look and say, oh, that's bad, I should do something about that, because that's the Mack truck about to hit you. You see where we have a problem? And this problem gets worse. How many of you ever seen this red and white manual here? It's about 20 pages thick. You ever seen one of these? They don't even print them anymore. They put a QR code on them. I'll tell you where you saw it. When's the last time you got brand new turnout gear? What was attached to it? That. You know what that is? The instructions. You know when I read that? 13 years ago. Do you know what I did after I read it? I suffer from anxiety. I take a pill to stop me from having certain issues. I had an anxiety attack, full blown. Went home, apologized to my wife, and I read 2 4 through 2 6 to her. And I read her that report and said, By the grace of God, I haven't done this, but Josh Early in our department died, and this is why. It says, You can be injured, burned, or killed with no visible damage to your PPE. And you should be constantly alert to conductive, convective, and radiant heat and the effects of it. How are we going to do that? if we don't carry something that allows us to see heat. Because the only animal that can see infrared is a snake. And I don't see any of you budding up with them, we're gonna carry it with us, no. That thing's dead around my house. So have you read this? This is free, you can Google it. Comes with every piece of equipment, you can pull it up, hood, gloves, everything. So let me tell you where this comes from. In that manual, when you said bee stings, or stinging, tingling sensation, there's a section in there that says, when you start to experience pain, you are experiencing something known as alarm time. Your body is trying to warn you, you are about to receive a second degree burn. Do you know where all this came from? My wife and I differ on history. I love history. She's actually taking my daughter to the Holocaust Museum today, and my daughter's into history. And I teach her about historical figures, and she's learned a lot about amazing women in history. And this woman, very few firefighters even know who she is. Her name is Alice Stoll. Any science geeks in the room? You ever heard of Stoll Curve? She invented the way to predict a second degree burn. She had F-4 Phantom pilots from the Navy crashing, and when they were crashing, their uniforms were shrink wrapping to her, to the, the pilot, and she wanted to figure out a way to stop heat transfer through fabrics. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Who do you think developed modern PPE based on that work? She did. In order for this to occur, she needed human victims to burn. How many people do you think signed up for that? 269 naval sailors were voluntold to do the thing, and they got a free weekend pass out of it. I'm sure they didn't feel anything after that, but her and her assistant Maria burned them right here on the forum. And this is what she discovered. At 131 degrees, you, re you receive a second degree burn in 24 hours, you get a blister, if it's direct contact. If that heat source stays there and the temperature increases to 140 degrees, remember this, your pain receptors are turned off. So if you want to fight fire with this, this, or any other body part, good luck after 140. Because the good Lord says, Andy's not too smart. Fight or flight kicks in, endorphins kick in, pain's turned off. Guess what happens at 162 degrees while I'm still in there, still cooking like a baked potato, because that's what I am. My skin is destroyed. Look up the Pete Dern story from Fresno, California, the captain walking across the roof and fell into the garage. See the fireball shoot up? He was wearing all his PPE except for his hood and his gloves. Look at his face and look at his hands and see what's missing. Pieces of him are gone, amputated. It don't grow back, okay? When you watch this video, 
I want you to ask yourself, how much protection do you really have in a simple Connex box where all we're doing is walking into a four by four room at a college and throw in a couple pallets. Look at his shoulders, three to 600 degrees apparent temperature. Look at his helmet, watch him. One, two, three, four. Now when he turns, you're gonna see him wince right there. He went and turned and the gear right here pushed up against his skin. Why did he go, ow, what happened? His gear was saturated and then what touched him? All that energy compressed, he killed that airspace, and he got a burn. That ever happened to you? Happened to me. Okay? Here's Miss Alice Stoll. I challenge you to look her up. I actually have her on my YouTube channel. You can see her nursing home videos where she tells some pretty amazing stories. And it tells what she did. And she's responsible for a lot of things you probably currently enjoy that you didn't even realize. Anybody familiar with Nomex? That's her work. Do you know that DuPont owned it and it had to be a five letter word that couldn't spell something backwards. The original name of it was No Melt and it was going to be No Mel until they spelled it backwards which meant lemon. So they changed it to No Mex. This is our history and yet we don't even know how our PPE was designed and what it took to do it. Look at one of my instructors being kind enough to give the ignition officer a break because we have ignition officers on every burn from the department and they're killing themselves loading and unloading these fires. So all my instructor is going to do is he went in and threw one pallet, he's going to flip that piece of OSB back onto the crib fire. I want you to look at his shoulders, his back, and watch his gloves, his bottle, his face piece. He was in there less than 20 seconds. How about this one? Hi, I'm not smart. <laughs> See this one? This is what we do in training. Do you know I do after actions every year for gear manufacturers where firefighters get burned, they blank out all the names, and I look at what the firefighter did, and they push the gear double past its limits, two times, and then blame the gear for getting burned. They don't even know that NFBA 1971 says your gear shall not melt, ignite, drip, or separate for up to 500 degrees for five minutes. That's it. That's all you got. You're like, what about flashover temperatures? For how many seconds? And how good is your gear? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it dirty? Did you go down the hallway and get saturated with energy and didn't open the nozzle? Do you really have the protection you think you have? And I will bet my paycheck that y'all sweat more in the summer than I do. What does your gear look like after running calls all day long, putting it on, taking it off during the summer in Dallas? What does your inner liner feel like? It's soaked, isn't it? What's the greatest conductor of heat? Anybody know? Salt water. What is your body putting off? Salt water. This can take your gear from three layers to two layers, and if you had 17 and a half seconds of protection per the minimum of the NFPA in your actual thermal protective performance, you would only have seven and a half seconds before you went in that burning building. And does that do any good, ladies and gentlemen, if all that protects you so good, but the only thing that separates you from rescuer to victim is a $12 piece of plastic known as your face piece? that the average failure is what we bake cookies at in our house was 356 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you see why you should be measuring heat and temperature? So, if you study NFBA 1971, you hear this following phrase, thermal protective performance, TPP. You ever heard that before? That's your life insurance. Notice what the max temperature is tested to. A controlled test environment consists of a temperature only up to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Does that surprise you? All the stuff you'll read will be 500, 600. The flashover temperatures are just seconds. Flame contact, seconds only. 500, 600 degrees max, that's all you got. And yet we're sitting in 1,000 degree burn rooms and trying to out-tough the next guy because you got on three hoods, he's got on three hoods, and he's wearing a wildland jacket underneath it. And you're putting unnecessary stress on your heart. Not a good idea. Did you know if you wash your gear the first five times, the TPP goes up? My TPP was 46, it went to 58. So whatever this number is, divide it by two. If it's 46, that means I have 23 seconds of protection and flashover temperatures until I receive a second degree burn. But what did I just show you? Do you really have 23 seconds? You know where you have the most protection? You wanna guess? Right here. Why? What's doubled up? You got, your coat's got three layers, your pants got three layers. Anywhere you got reinforcements, your elbows and knees, that's doubled up. Where you got the least protection? Right here and right here. How hot does your gloves get pretty quickly if you grab a hold of something? Okay. 
So we don't, we're not as protected as well as we think, right? Your gear works by absorbing and releasing energy. If you fail to understand your armor and then blame it when you get hurt, the gear company's not negligent. We as the customer are. Your gear is not bulletproof. It will max out like a sponge. When it absorbs all the water it can, that water's gonna leak out. When your gear absorbs all the energy it can, where's that energy gonna go? It's not going off going hot to cold. You're 98.6 degrees and you're actually coldest thing around it, so where's that energy being transferred to? You. You ever wrapped a baked potato in aluminum foil and cooked it? When you unwrap the aluminum foil, the potatoes cook. Could you reuse that foil? Yes. Yes, you can. If you go in Fire Station 27 and look up in the, in the ceiling, there's a plexiglass case with a coat that says early on it. It was Joshua's coat. We just, 20 years ago last month is when he passed away. He fell into a fully involved basement fire for less than one minute. His coat looks like you could put it on and wear it. The last thing Josh said was, I know I'm hurt, but I don't look that bad. His skin looked like everybody's in here until four days later he died. 87% of his body burned, second and third degree burns, multi-system organ failure. He fell into a basement, saturated with energy. The captain actually burned himself, hooking the door and reaching down to pull Josh out. Your gear does not make you Superman or Superwoman, okay? This makes you brave, you hear me? And here's the problem. This is a NFPA 1403 burn in my home state. We're filming and we, we expressed our concern after we saw this and they told us we could leave, that this is how they do business. The camera's turned sideways because you'll learn this in part two. We call this the gangster grip. It increases your field of view, helps you see floor to ceiling. Yeah, it's, it's catchy, people like it, but See the, see the instructor looking into the burn room? I haven't taught you anything about thermal imaging yet. And tell me if you're okay with this instructor teaching two brand new kids with their brand new gear who just graduated firefighter one and two to fight fire this way. What's closed here, ladies and gentlemen? The nozzle. Now let's stand in front of the dragon's throat and admire it because we're teaching, right? Now we're gonna open the nozzle. Any of you pump operators in the room? Does this look like a properly pumped stream to you? What are these two firefighters gonna do the very first fire they go to and they're on that nozzle by themselves? They're gonna fight it this way. I was corrected recently in, in Lyft. Whether you know it or not, we all need to be corrected. The student came up to me and said, you called it a training scar, I have to disagree. I said, I'm listening. He said, a scar means it's healed and you've learned from it. This is a training wound. The fire service is still bleeding because of these actions. I was like, man, I'm going to quote you on that. First three times and after that it's mine. So is this a good idea, ladies and gentlemen? What is that $12 piece of plastic that's two to three millimeters thick, thick known as polycarbonate face piece doing as they're getting hit with fast moving convection currents at three, four, five hundred degrees? Saturating and softening it. It softens at 290 and can fail upwards of 600 depending on the mask you're wearing. But let's think about this definition that you've heard before in your basic training called pyrolysis. What does that mean? If I'm heating up this desk, what is this desk gradually doing per pyrolysis? It's called off-gassing. It's the thermal decomposition of a substance through the action of heat. It gradually breaks it down into gases which then what? Burn. So let's talk about pyrolysis from three perspectives. Remember I said I wanted you to look at this from the victim, their property, and you. The victim starts screaming in pain on a good Texas summer day. 109.4 degrees, direct contact with their skin, they're hurting. 113 to 118, they're experiencing alarm time, they're ready to fight you. Their property can start off-gassing or producing flammable vapors as low as 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Some are around 4 to 600 degrees depending on the product. Does it surprise you it's that low? And then you, as a firefighter, can be in trouble anywhere between 290 degrees and 572. Did you think it was that low? I'm going to share some information with you that's all out of the instructions per the manufacturer. Okay? This is the warning I went home and shared with my wife directly out of the FEMSA manual. If your PPE is exposed to radiant, convective, or conductive heat, you may be burned underneath to that ensemble with no warning no sign of damage to that ensemble. Be constantly alert to the possibility of exposure to radiant, convective, or conductive heat. How are you going to do that if you wait until you feel pain? Are you telling me we're going to continue to wait 
to get hurt before we try to fix it. That's a reactive stance, not a proactive stance. See the target. Take the target out. This is Mark Falkenhan's mask. Do you realize every time we have had a change in the fire service, it has been due to two reasons, tragi tragedy and litigation. This is his mask after 500 degrees at 148 seconds. You hear that? He's on the third floor above where the fire flash trapped in a thousand degree flow path. He's at the back, the firefighter's at the front. The firefighter at the front makes the window and gets out. Mark does not. That was supposed to be Mark's last day on the job. He was supposed to go to work for the FBI the next day, training their EMS division. They asked why the ATF produced the most in-depth line of duty death study I've ever seen. You can watch for free on YouTube. It's called the ATF study of, of Mark Falkenhans line of duty death. You can look it up. It's two one hour videos and it's very powerful. The part where he dies, they have a mannequin viewing from the face piece, looking out, playing his mayday. If that doesn't affect you in a positive way that makes you say, I need to do something differently about the way I fight fire, perhaps we should look at a different occupation. Because it's not about being tough, it's about being smart and tough, okay? This is a firefighter's mask, it's an AV2000. Not everybody is NFPA compliant. These two firefighters did not come to class in Woodlands, Texas when I taught this class. They went to a double wide home fire, mobile home fire the next day. He has a helmet cam. He's standing in front of an open front door. Black smoke is pushing out and hitting him in the face. I challenge you when I say this, biggest problem in our service today is not fire behavior. It's not tick stuff. It's not nozzle stuff. You know what it is? It's the person at pump panel. Watch YouTube. You'll hear it every day. Guy's holding a limp hose line and you'll hear pump primer. It's taking forever to get water. We need some intelligently aggressive pump operators. He stands in front of that door for less than one minute and you see him do this. And you see his hood fall off in his hand. He didn't get burned. Look at his face piece. That is considered failed. If you have a visual acuity of 2100, which means you can't see, your mask is done. I've seen some masks that didn't have heat damage that was done just because we treated them bad. Okay? How about this guy? It's one of my instructors. Doesn't know he's being filmed in Canada. Is this a good idea? Tell our recruits, get down, get down, get down, while we're standing up from our hypocritical stance because, you know, crawling sucks and I got bad knees. You know what they're thinking? I can't wait till I'll be an instructor. I'm going to yell at people and I'm going to stand up and wear three hoods. We're perpetuating a problem. Here's some actual data for you to consider as we move forward. Human skin is destroyed at 162. The average temperature at your face piece fails was 356 per those studies, a range between 290 and 447. The best hoods on the market, with the exception of the Reed hood and the Captain Jim hood, start to break down and char at 572. The Reed hood and the Captain Jim hood, you could walk through Satan's living room and go, man, that was a little warm. I'm not a big fan of that. Best firefighter I know, Jason Jeffries, says firefighting should be inherently painful. You should know something bad is going on. At 1128 degrees, that is the auto ignition of carbon monoxide. Why should you care about that? What is the primary component of all the bad things in smoke that we can't predict? When you burn something inefficiently, what does it produce more of than anything? That's why we have CO detectors in all our homes. And if this fire reaches flashover, look at the average temperature. 1,832 degrees, four times the limitation of your gear. If you're, if you're not within three to five feet of a door, what have they proven? You're done. I'm sitting in bed one night, my wife's over there reading. She reads way too much fire service stuff. She reaches over and grabs a very sensitive part of my side and twists. She says, do I have your attention? I'm like, yeah. She says, I'm reading about a Nance drill, a Denver drill. There better not ever be a Starnes drill. See how you change your perspective when you have people that you're supposed to be responsible for, whether it's your, you're the nozzle and you may be looking at your brother or sister. He might be the captain. He's thinking about the firefighters. She might be the battalion chief. She's thinking about the battalion. I'm not telling you not to be aggressive. I'm telling you to think. This is an enemy, and we're not fighting it. Because look at this. So you can find this on Facebook for free. This Illinois Fire Service Institute, they do some amazing work. If you're not following them, please check them out. These are three different face pieces meeting the NFPA standards of the time that they were produced. Each one of these start to fail at one minute and 34 seconds. You know what they're doing to them to make them fail? They have a blower sending superheated air right in front of it, convection currents. They use a convection oven to test your gear. Did you know that? 
The forced air oven test is one of 70 tests in NFPA 1971 used to test your gear. Not fire, heat. Yet, we're not open the nozzle till we see fire. If you met a veteran firefighter, I bet you heard them say, hey, that stuff you can't see over your head, it's hot. They called it black fire. You ever heard that? You know what Sir William Herschel, who discovered infrared energy, called the, the, the light beyond visible light that was causing the most heat? What he called it originally? Dark heat. Couldn't see it, but it was hotter. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Look at the ultimate failure of these masks. 218, 346, and the newer mask that was made because of Mark Falkenhan's incident, 1004. What happens when you wipe your mask when your mask is soft? Anybody know? If you read these face piece studies, every one of the failures they document was accompanied by mechanical damage. It was heat, and then the firefighter either ran into something or wiped his or her mask. Now they're teaching to wipe with the back of the hand because if I do this, I'm liable to push and do what? Collapse it, right? Two to three millimeters of polycarbonate is all that separates me and you from rescuer to victim. Does that concern you? You know what concerns me more than that? Is how we treat that mask. See him dragging across the floor, not checking it. Take your cell phone when you go back to work. You got a little flashlight that comes on all the time for no reason. I can't stand that. Take your face piece and lay it on, preferably not one that has like striations like this, maybe a, a solid color background, and simply run the light back and forth. Make sure the webbing's out of the way. And look, if you see shadows cast, you can actually look this up on Illinois Fire Service Institute. The shadows you're seeing cast are known as thermal damage or micro cracks. When's the last time you did that to your mask? I didn't start doing it until several years ago. If you find a micro crack in your mask, what is it going to do the next time you exposed it to severe radiant heat? Especially if you're a live burn instructor, it's going to open up wider or fail. Is that what you want to wait on? I have seen more professions in high risk that do amazing inspections of their gear. Have you ever watched a lineman roll back their glove and look for a pinhole? Have you ever look at all the trouble they go through? Because if they touch something wrong without their gear, what happens to them? They're dead. You ever looked at the electrical guys who wear the arc flash protection? They're really particular about their stuff. Don't touch my stuff, I inspect my stuff. Yet yeah, we throw our stuff in the locker, dirty gear, and let the plyma vent off and blast it with diesel smoke and don't care. And then expect it to perform. Big problem. How many of you felt the air inside of your bottle get hot before? Did you think it was the air inside your bottle? Because I did too, when it's actually the air inside your face piece. They actually tested this. They put a mask on a mannequin, and they did the same thing, blew that superheated air over it, and they put two thermal couples inside the mannequin's mouth and measured the inside temperature of the mouth. This is what should really concern you more than anything. The mask did not fail, but I want you to look at the temperatures inside the mouth. Anywhere between 131 degrees to 205 degrees. At 20 minutes at 392 degrees Fahrenheit, the air inside that mouth reached 205. Anyone paramedics in the room? What happens to the inside of an unprotected victim's trachea when they breathe superheated gases, specifically between 187 and 212? Anybody know? What does the trachea do if it's like this? Can we fix that? No. You can die with your mask on. You're trapped, breathing that, hitting you all the time, and they're waiting on the RIT team. You're in there hanging out too long. That is the entire uh, study in one slide, NIST Technical Note 1809, Exploratory Study of Airflow from SCBA to Elevated Temperatures. Everything I'm giving you today comes from a research paper or a line of duty death. I am not going to risk your life on my opinion. And I have had manufacturers argue with me. Well, they can't give you an exact. No, I can't give you an exact, but I can give you data because the environment you go in is not exact. Every fire has different variables, different you know, things you're going to face, right? And if you want to read something, probably the most disturbing thing, this comes directly out of this manual. Anybody ever heard of this company, the Luxfer, and Luxfer manual? Luxfer. How many of you wear air packs? All of us. Who makes almost every SCBA cylinder in existence today? Luxfer. Their instruction manual for a composite bottle. In general, a carbon composite cylinder that reaches a temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit or more should be sent to an authorized cylinder requalification facility before 
being returned to service. You can get the inside of that cylinder 120 degrees by simply hurrying up the filling process. Ever done that? Man, my bottle's hot. Thanks so much for getting it to me. Mm -mm, no, thank you. Does that scare you? This should concern you even more. Firefighters can wear composite cylinders with complete confidence even though they are frequently exposed to higher temperatures because a firefighter is never exposed to excessive heat to affect cylinder properties. Do you think there's a disconnect between the people who make the cylinder, the gear, and you and me? This one right here. Even when wearing this equipment, a firefighter will feel sufficient discomfort from life-threatening heat before thermal exposure could damage a cylinder. Well, that's a subjective statement. Because guess what? You might not feel it. He might. What if your gear is wet and old, dirty? Yeah, you might feel it. But if you've got brand new gear and wearing all this different protection, you may not feel it at all until it's too late. All this comes up to, I want you to look at each part of your gear. Your helmet, your helmet shall not melt below 500 degrees. Your hood has a minimum of a TPP of 20. Your gear is supposed to have a minimum of 35. Some hoods are greater than that. Your SCBA softens at 290, failure at 356. Your gloves, average TPP, not less than 35, but your interface layer, not less than 20, shall not melt or below 500 degrees. Your coat, minimal TPP, but can have reinforced areas above 60. They don't rate it above 60. Your pants, the same, TPP of 35. Your boots, 20 minutes at 500 degrees. Cylinder of an SCBA, core shall not reach 160. Your tick, the front of the tick, the germanium window, this right here, known as its eyeball, should not be exposed to greater than 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Your radio, average temperature failure for radios was approximately 300 degrees and there is not a current thermal requirement rating for fire radios. Why in the world are we not looking at the environment we're in and saying, I'm not telling you not to go, I'm telling you to fix it before you go because it makes it better for them and for who? Each of you. And each of your gear, whether it's an SCBA, a tick, uh, radio, anything that has an electronic sense was tested in one of these four environments and your tick has this color palette so we kind of did this together. Joey Baxter, one of my instructors, did this. Your stuff will start to fail after 212 degrees Fahrenheit after 25 minutes or 320 degrees Fahrenheit after 15 minutes or 500 degrees Fahrenheit after 5 minutes or if you've got fast moving convection currents, class 4 environment, Michelle O'Donnelly says in this research paper, the likelihood of a first responder being in a class 4 thermal environment for greater than one minute is highly unlikely and strongly discouraged. One minute. Now, how many, let's, let's, I'm not captain, but let's go confession. How many of you, including me, have been in over 500 degrees with fast moving smoke for more than one minute? We're racing physics. We got away with it. Does that mean we're going to get away with it next time? No. So what we see, ladies and gentlemen, is often misleading. This is helmet cam footage from a working kitchen fire. How are you going to fight it? That's playing right now. Hey, I'm supposed to look for fingers of fire. I'm supposed to look for fast moving smoke. There are five flashlights in here. Oh, there's one. How's this work again? So are we really preparing them for the environment they face? This is us teaching recruits different ticks looking into a fire room. Does this look dangerous to you? We're outside of the room in a burn building looking into the burn room. That flashing red light's my head. I keep getting in the way. My dad says I do a good job of blocking the camera, right? So does that look like that's dangerous to you? That's outside the fire room. Let's look at it through the eyes of your FLIR camera. This is the top of the door casing. And I want you to look at what's coming out of the door casing and what's inside the room. Notice the triangle. That fast moving gray white stuff is convection currents. Yellow is 3 to 600. Red is 9 to 1200. What's inside the room? Notice that you can see details in the color that you can't with standard infrared cameras. There's only two cameras on the market that produce images this well. That is the FLIR KXX series or the Bullard NXT. And they both have pros and cons, but that's called image enhancement. We'll talk about that later. Two images, exact same environment. You need training and knowledge and technology to get you on the path. Look, communicate, fix it. Put the camera down. I do not want you to think this is a video game and be going through there like my daughter and her tablet and <laughs> refusing to put the thing down. 
because then you get tunnel vision. Everybody good with that? So I have light smoke blowing out this door. A quick look at the front door helps me see what? What's down that hallway? We talked a lot yesterday with the other class about other things you can do with this camera. It's a one button camera, you can't do anything than what it's set up to, to do. But y'all have truck companies that have two cameras. You can program this to another mode called search and rescue mode that shows colorization at 200 degrees. Now it maxes out at 300, so it's an investigative mode for size up or after the fact, we use it for early or late. We got a low heat situation. The firefighters are looking here, can't see squat. I flip it to search mode and it highlights just around that next corner. What do I see? That way to the fire, where in, in TI basic, which I'll tell you about, it doesn't show color till 302 degrees, so it's just a white spot. I hate to break it to you, but the most of us misinterpret white or grayscale and miss things, okay? Is this important for you to note? You open the front door and you wanna know where the fire is. Can you tell me where the fire is based on this short, quick little video? All my videos are firefighter ADHD approved. They're less than two minutes long. I will not bore you longer than two minutes. <coughs> Down the hall to the what? Would you start your nozzle flowing water here? I would start flowing here and reach down that hallway and do that because what is that stuff flowing over your head? Again, let's look at it again. What is that stuff flowing over your head right here? That's heat. That's hotter down there. This hasn't heated up the surface enough to show color yet. So just because you don't see color doesn't mean it's not hot. And numerous firefighters burn because they ignore that. Okay. How about this guy? He's instructing a husband and wife team that just graduated firefighter one and two. This department has nine firefighters, or at least they did, on their roster in a very small town in Minnesota. And they're doing their first live burn. I'm filming. We just taught some tick stuff downstairs to another group. And he's watching this husband and wife team who are doing this together, which I think is awesome. He's got a tick. What is he failing to miss here? What is he missing? That camera he's holding doesn't show color on it till 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I walked to him and said, hey, brother, you need to tell him to open the nozzle. He's like, what? I don't see anything. I put this camera side by side. Didn't teach him anything on, on the camera. His eyes, you ever seen somebody's eyes through a face piece? His eyes do this, and he goes, open the nozzle. Sorry, he paid attention to color, and they started flowing water. Okay? Low sensitivity, fast-moving convection currents, colorization. Look at the detail your camera provides. So my question before you, before we take a break, is this. Do you look both ways before you cross the street with your family or your loved ones, even yourself? Then why do we take any firefighter, young, old, whoever, up to a door of a burning building that we've never been in and say, get in there. And you say, you know, a millennial, I'm going to challenge you. That's what millennials do, right? I'm going to say, Captain, where would you like me to go? Get in there. The fire's in there. Well, my 12-year-old can tell you the fire is in there. But where is the fire? What is the fire location, severity? Where is the victim probable locations? What is the layout for you, the challenges or the path? If you take a road trip, I bet you look at directions. If you're doing street school, I bet you know the routes. The military thinks we're crazy because we go into a building we've never been in before with four to six minutes prep time and no pre-plan, but yet they will drill on a target for months. Know it inside and out, different ways out, but we got four to six minutes and our version of getting in there is using our spidey senses and our flashlights that we can see four to five feet with, if that, and try to figure it out. Is that a smart attack plan? Okay. And you can see things, ladies and gentlemen, with this camera you have now that can affect you that's far more greater than heat. You ready? Company officer comes to the door. We teach a simple concept known as the gangster grip. This camera is 38 degrees tall, 51 degrees wide. Well, I'm not a math magician, but 51 is bigger than 38. If I turn it sideways, it does not change the screen other than now I have 51 degrees. If I drop down to one knee and look, I can now see the floor and the ceiling in one view. The two areas I'm most concerned with, where the victim might be and where the fire is. I simply show them, hey, this is a nice, big, open floor plan. How many houses have open floor plans? A lot of them. And I see a big, long dining room table. And I see the table and I see, oh my God, there's three high chairs and a wheelchair. That's how detailed your imagery is. Well, does that affect where you're searching and who you're searching for? Possibly four non-ambulatory patients. Could be. 
Doubt the person in the wheelchair is going to be on the second floor. Most times they're not in a house. This is how this can help you. Does that make sense? 